I've actually... Where are we? Oh, We're, there it is. We are in Cluj at the moment. And there's... <laughs> the moment I turn on the camera... I s the first airplane. Yeah, but that's okay. That's part of it. That's part of it. So, we are in Cluj at the French Institute. And the reason why there's a cinema screen there is because... The Transylvania International Film Festival has just ended. And, uh, but we're not here to talk about that today. Even though Trans the Transylvania International Film Festival was where I met this gentleman that I'm gonna be, that the camera is slowly making its way towards. And, uh, oh, here he is, almost to the middle of the frame, drinking a, some uh, substance of some kind. Nah, it's, this is, it's Pepsi. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to the camera? <laughs> sure, my name is Caesar. Um, basically, we're going to talk about some 3D design, some design work in general. From the perspective of somebody who actually tried to run away from design most of his life and ended up being a designer. How did you end up being a designer though? Well, actually it's a weird, a bit of a long but weird story. So I started working at 14. Uh, decided to start working after a brief dance with death. Jumped out the window. I live at the bottom floor of the building, so it was ah. a very big jump. It was just my basically the first steps towards adulthood that were not much legal in my mother's eyes. Right. So I went to work for a little cafe called Gothic. It used to be uh, the only rocker pub in town. And when I started there, I started as a DJ helping some friends. Hmm. Two months later, the owner of the pub said, do you know any Photoshop? I see you doodling all day, so could you do a poster? I said, sure, I'll do a poster. After a poster, a flyer. After a flyer, a menu. After a menu, an entire design for another pub. And so on and so forth. And I ended up working design part-time while going through high school. Then I was a coffee shop uh, bartender, part owner in one, so on and so forth. Ironically, I did not study design. I went for sociology and after that, social work. Oh. And from that, I started to work in IT. And while working in IT, my team leader at the time said, uh, you know, we have a design position opening. You could apply for it. I said, okay, what do I have to do? Well, you have to do a little test and there's going to be an interview. There's going to be a practical exam. And after that, maybe you'll get the job. So I did all that got the, the job for design for a company in Germany and about two weeks after that they had an upper level position for design opening. I said okay I'll apply for that as well. I was young and I was ambitious I said why the hell not <laughs> and in about maybe six months a bit less I ended up working as a consecrator and creative lead for one of the major design and advertising companies of Europe. Right. And after that, my career went down south because non-disclosures, non-competes, and everything tied me up. But I said, okay, that's not a problem. I got the experience, and I said, I'm coming back to Romania at the end of the project, and I'm going to bring something new to the country. So I said, I'm going to bring 3D printing from a classic perspective, as in everybody the 3D prints tries to go for the exaggerated moments, the exaggerated sculptures, the forms that you can find in nature. Hmm. I go for the reverse. Everything starts from a pen and paper perspective. From the pen and paper, we go into a little bit of symbolistic moments, a uh, little bit of inspiration, what exactly we're trying to capture in the respective design. And after that, we're going to make it from a sketch to a 3D model, from a 3D model to the actual shape and form. Wow, so that's, that's how you, uh, that's your beginnings. Basically. But I also wanted to know, meanwhile I'm look, trying to find a comfortable way to sit. Uh, this is the beauty of not cutting. But what about, um, But so you kind of stumbled into it, but do you think that you were, you I had an stumbled interest? stumbled into it. My mother was an architect. So okay, right. Willingly or not, I was actually picking up a lot from her while I was young. Were, do you, were you uh, into the arts in general when you were growing up? Quite a bit, so I actually found a lot of um, inspiration from Konstantin Benkush. I like the idea of uh, how he simplified every uh, moment in his sculptures. Okay, yeah. For example, the, um, the most uh, simple sculpture, how do you define the beauty of a woman? Mm. He defined it by an erection. He literally made a sculpture which is an erection. 
<laughs> that is the simplest way to say the woman is beautiful. Right. And similar to that, he also has the kiss, which is a very naive sculpture when you look at it. But once you start appreciating it and studying it more, you find it's not that naive. It's actually deep, and you're just missing the point when you see it first time. Mm. So I went a bit from that direction and perspective to what I was starting to work with. As in, when I sketch, I take something complex and break it down and try to make a naive form of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from yeah. that, a bit of a cartoonish uh, hint, that's my personal preference. But right. Not all my clients like that. Well, supposedly, now I must, I must uh, admit, I'm not an expert at all in 3D printing. No, uh, I Nobody is. <laughs> Actually, there are a lot of people who claim they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you get down to it, it's part engineer, part uh, sculpture, math, part sculpture, sculpture exactly. yeah. design work, 3D modeling, sketching, ideas. It's basically wild and fun at the same time. And you mentioned that you wanted to bring a more natural sort of type of... Yes, exactly. A more natural sort of type, like okay. the simple egg holder, for example. Right. Here we go. Here's a simple egg holder. What do you see in it? I see... I see... Well, something that holds an egg, but I also see something else at the bottom. Exactly, but you also see the lines. It's oh, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit the idea of a wood carving. So it's going yeah. concentric lines on top of each other. It's the, not smooth. It's not smooth. It's a little bit rough, it's a little bit, uh, some would say unfinished, but it's actually the way I wanted it to be. The little thing on the bottom is for the eggshells. But let's say you have a smaller egg. You go like this. Ah, uh, yeah. You no longer have the eggshell holder, but you do have a place for a smaller egg. That's right. That's it's right. simple. Actually, it was a little bit inspired from uh, the silent table from Konstantin Brankosh as well. I love the chairs. The simple design for the chairs was a bit of an idea for the egg holder. Yeah. And the car for the egg holder it was just a decision to be more natural. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't like uh, the idea of making it brown. And the only car that would uh, pop out in contrast with the red egg for Easter would be green. So a lot of people would see these lines, and this is my interpretation of it, as imperfection, right? Exactly. But you like that. I like the imperfections. Ah, in that's it. And that is something that I love too. Imperfections. A well, weak steer. Nowadays, you can get anything perfect designed by somebody from an industry who is paid to make 10,000 examples of the same thing over and over and over. But when you go for 3D printing, you either go for modeling, mm -hmm. basically, you need something to build upon, you need a working functional model of something, or you need something which is unique. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, affordable. Right. But this thing about imperfections fascinates me because, in a way, that's my idea of having this long take uh, documentary, interview, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, is because it opens up possibilities for imperfections. Exactly. And I think that in imperfections, there is possibilities. I mean, I think uh, even when we fall in love, we fall in love with imperfections, you know? We don't fall in love with perfections. That's the idea. Even though the imperfections could seem as perfections for us, but, you know, the imperfection is where, is where, where it's all at. Everything that. gets a little bit spicy, everything takes a little bit of savior in life. Do you want when to show me something I go else? for something a bit more perfect, ah. this would be the final print version. Wow. It's the Witcher head from Witcher 3. Loved the game had to make it to uh, wear it and I said why the hell not I'm going to 3D print it put it on my backpack and sew it with some red line to go with the red idea the motif you made this yeah you designed it and then you printed you I didn't print design it somebody that made the game made the original yeah, yeah, design but okay. I made it into a 3D version I guess we'll, we'll get Got more into a bit more right and yeah, after yeah. that said okay this is going directly on my backpack yeah, it looks pretty cool, man. So we'll get more into the working method later, too. Is there anything else you brought? You have a few things there. The main project, the one that I'm most proud of, you're going to have to get the photos from Instagram. It's okay. a motorcycle. Why, why don't, do you want to show me? Um, I don't have the motorcycle, but I do have it on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. That's fine. This is, uh, this is the imperfections that we were talking about. Instagram. 
so it was a motorcycle from a friend who's a bit crazy like I am and he said he wanted to make something more eye-opening on the road so we designed a 3D uh, skull and he said okay I want the person that had the skull to have a little bit of a backstory so we said okay how did he die he died by head trauma uh, what yeah. head trauma could that be let's say he was an industrial worker or somebody who worked on the railroad and as such his entire skull got cracked open and as such we made a little bit of a neck where the head would have uh, hit the ground oh, I see yeah, yeah, yeah. and the top is completely shaven off as if something very sharp ended his life okay so we got him a little bit of a backstory the teeth as well have imperfections they're not very visible but they're a bit crooked yeah they're a bit wor worn down like mine one has a cavity the other has a filling that we re made uh, the space for hmm. and the eye sockets and uh, nose as well has a bit of an imperfection as if the skull has spent some time in the ground wow so we went for all the details the painting on the other hand that was the main problem we had to do a lot of shadowing on it and the original was not made in white it was actually made on blue filament so we can go and see any problems and any details that we need to cover the print itself took 42 hours we did it in shifts basically we started the printer and every couple of hours you have to make sure that everything is okay with the print so try, and, try and put it up vertically because i'm getting a lot of reflection i think reflection. maybe yeah that's a that's little bit better yeah, yeah. Hmm. So the wife and I spent a couple of hours in shifts making sure that the print doesn't have any issues and we just printed it in one go. Ah. And also besides that we had to print the logo for the motorcycle. It was a Yamaha originally before we started reconditioning it. And the Fuck logo the rider. Try to live. Exactly. The logo has the motto from the owner of the bike. That's his personal motto. Fuck <laughs> the rider, try to live. Hmm. That looks great. So that was for the, for a motorbike. That was for a motorbike. Yeah. That looks that looks awesome. It took a lot of time, but the backstory for it was uh, what we enjoyed. So right. we tried to get the backstory for the skull, we also had a backstory for the bike, the bike was reconditioned, hmm. so it was about, I don't know, maybe 30 years old at the time that we were starting to recondition it. Uh, the owner of the bike had several accidents in uh, his life, he also hmm. uh, had a major accident a couple of years ago when somebody cut him off and he went into a coma. So the idea of a cracked skull ah. actually came from that original accident because he cracked uh, the headgear and the headgear itself punctured a bit uh, yeah. the skull when he hit the pavement. He's owning what happened to him. Exactly. He's ah. owning what's happening with him and he also owns the idea that he's sooner or later going to die as an old person still riding a motorcycle. So the motorcycle itself is also getting a tombstone on the back end, which uh, by design currently has his name, yeah. year of birth, a blank space for the year of death that we're going to fill whenever it happens, with uh, a little bit of a secondary motto, you're looking at my life, but my life was fun. Oh, so wait a minute, wait a minute. So he literally wants to take the back end of the motorcycle and make it into a tombstone the moment that it's time, just take it off, place it there, and that is the tombstone. Already printed, already ready, just at the date. I am fascinated by that story. How did you He's meet him, do you know? I met him while working, uh, while working collaborating with uh, a friend for another coffee shop called Nomad. He was just starting out and uh, he wanted a little bit of uh, an advice on the design, on the interiors, on the menus, a little bit of marketing done for him. I said, okay, why not? I got a couple of hours. <laughs> and he was the handyman working there. And when he parked the bike, he kept talking about how he wants to uh, modify it, how he wants to recondition it. And I just said, well, have you thought about 3D printing something for it? And he just lit up like a kid on Christmas. 3D print what? <laughs> 
So whatever you want, it's 3D printing. Just name it, we can design it, we can make it. It's not a problem. Holy crap. And it's not even that expensive. The skull itself was, let's say in euros, that would be easier, I think. Yeah. In euros, it should be around 35 euros, hmm. maybe less. Really? 120 ron, the big skull that came on top of it. That's not bad. That's the price of the paint, and that was it. And how long does that last? I mean... The skull or... The 3D... Pr yeah, the yeah, 3D something print. like the skull. Something like the skull would last a bit longer. Mm. Uh, the plastic uh, that I use is biodegradable. So this would be the sample paint. Print. More skulls, more skulls. More yeah, skulls, yeah. some in detail, some in not. Some with rough ending, some with uh, a bit of a rough texture. Can I feel it? Sure, go for it. And on the bottom you'll feel oh, the smooth really... texture of the print. That's really, uh, yeah, that seems pretty resistant. Take a <laughs> shot of this. Oh, I didn't get a shot of it, but uh, if you heard the noise, it didn't break. It's not going to break. Oh, it's just going to. Well, yeah, that's because he threw. <laughs> but, but yeah, this will not break. It has a tensile strength uh, of 250 kilograms on impact. Holy crap! And it can take even more when it's printed for solid, like these are. So when you try to hit it here, it's actually a solid mesh. And that's here you crazy. You can see the difference between uh, non-solid and. A solid. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So when yeah. you're going for a bit of a more inexpensive print, you're going to get this structure inside, mm -hmm. like a honeycomb structure. But it's also pretty resilient itself. I mean, you can try to bend it, break it. Yeah, I can it. see it's less resistant, but it's still... Uh, it's still going to do the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the for skull itself yeah. was made as a solid print, mm -hmm. and that solid print after we uh, made it, we tested it by dropping 400 kilograms right on top of it. Right. It didn't crack, it didn't um, bend or anything like that. So how do you test it? Like, what, what, how do you drop that weight we on it? We literally got the weight. Ah, uh, yeah? <laughs> Pulled it up by a gurney and let it loose. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it survived that impact and it said, okay, that's perfect. And after that, we found out that uh, the Romanian laws for motorcycles are a bit actually more easy to uh, go and work with. Mm. As in, I can modify anything on a motorcycle as yeah. long as I don't modify the engine or the capacity or the strength of the motorcycle itself. And that's basically full freedom when it comes to design. That's also for cars then, I guess, yeah. right? For cars, Not it's for cars. actually a bit rougher. You <laughs> can't even modify a car's exterior. Okay. So that's illegal here. Mm -hmm. If you want to modify a car's uh, exterior, you have to get uh, the permissions. You have yeah. to get it tested by the maker of the car, mm -hmm. the original maker. And after you go through all that, you also have to get uh, the permits for it uh, to be roadworthy from the Romanian state. In all, it's going to take eight months plus a lot of money. Right. I wanted to modify my own car. When I saw the price tag, I said, it's okay, I can live with the car. It's, it's yeah, nice, yeah, yeah. it's perfect, it's golden. I'll just deal with it. Sure. Hey, so I want to ask you more about, uh, you know, the, uh, another question that I had for you. What was the first thing that you 3D printed? The first, Do you remember? first print. Yeah. Or actually, even if it was a failed attempt, what did you intend to? It was a failed attempt. It was actually one of the most um, oh nerve-wracking attempts of my career. Check it out. I'm a Warhammer 40k fan. And this was a tech price that I could not find available anywhere. As in, I was playing the game, and the little tech priest that had something that uh, was just holding its place until that moment. So I made this one for myself. It took about four days, you know. Yeah. Very small details, very fine printing, I can a lot see of that. patience, and after that, a lot of assembly. And after all the assembling, the problem is I have a cat and a dog. <laughs> yeah. So the cat got this part, and the dog actually nibbled a little bit here. Uh. But it's okay, I still have the original STL. In case I ever need the Turk Priest again, I'll just reprint it. So that is the first one you did? The first one Not I bad. did, and the only one for myself. <laughs> 
That's not bad. That's Could pretty good better. for a first... Uh, there's a lot of detail in it. A lot of detail. The platform itself was the only thing that I did not expect to take so much. Mm. As in, when printing small details, it's actually simple because the printer will go back and forth yeah. and gently make the detail. But when you're printing something that is round, it's going to start going concentrically, constantly, yeah. constantly, then coming back and forth on top of it, and yet again. And the platform itself took more than it took just to print the face, which has an enormous amount of detail. Yeah, I can see that. Why did it take longer to do the platform? Because the platform itself is round, oh, okay. and it has to go for each and every moment. And on the platform, I wanted a little bit of texture. Yeah, so there's yeah, yeah. a little bit of an imperfection, so you can paint on top of it. You, I guess I can see that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and after that I found out that there's a limit that uh, you can do this because it's not worth the time, the patience, okay. or the waiting around just for a little platform. So, <laughs> from now on I'm buying my platforms in bulk because that's cheaper. I'm yeah. i whatever else I need. Um, what else do you want to know? The uh, what's, process from start? I want, yeah, I'd love to know like what, uh, yeah, the process is kind of like, so but before we move on, so can you tell me again, how long did that take you? About so, four days. Four days, so designing, how long does that take Design you? Designing didn't take that long because it's a popular game, so I managed to find a lot ah, okay. of already um, made uh, parts from it. Yeah. There is also a Warhammer 40k game that you can play online and there is also the computer version. Yeah, and yeah, from yeah. that you can just take the renders and just redesign them and repurpose them. So the design part was a bit less, but the printing part and the fine prints itself, plus the polishing, the chemical bath, that took the most. And the printing then, how long does it take? The printing itself, this was the done in thing. one day. One, one whole day one then? One whole day, roughly 16 hours because 16 of the small hours. details, everything was printed separately. Yeah. And after that you go for chemical baths. The chemical baths take uh, between 8, 12 and respectively one day, Okay. depending on the part. The more it stays in the chemical bath, the finer the print will be. Right. So for example, this is without a chemical bath. As you said, you can see the imperfections. Yes. And. There's also so something. the chemical bath gets rid of some of the imperfections. Exactly, it will get rid of so most of the imperfections, if not all. Okay. And when you go for a chemical bath, this was a cover that I printed. Right. This very will smooth. Be the texture at the end. Okay. After that, you just have to paint it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the part where I didn't paint it that much because I over smoothed. Yeah. As in, literally, it has no pores for the paint to stick on. So the paint, after some time, started to wear down. So you even have to be careful sometimes, because then... <laughs> if you overdo it, then you don't have a good painting surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you underdo it, then you're going to have a rough surface. It looks pretty good, though. It's a bit of a trial and error. This actually is uh, a sticker from Paul. Yeah, yeah. If you get a chance to make the interview, it was from his movie. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, he, he left uh, after the day after I called him. Ah, uh, he left already? Yeah, he'll be back on the 15th. It's unfortunate. We couldn't, we couldn't make it happen. Do it on Skype. No, I have to be in person, but I'll be back. I'll be back, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, yeah, so tell me more. Tell, so, okay, so we, get, we got a f an idea of how long it takes, but now it'd be nice to like actually know more about the, the process. The process itself. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, what is the material, like the mat even the material? The material is plastic, PLA. Plastic. So it's you put it exactly in the... exactly the same plastic that you would find in most uh, old cell phones, yeah. TVs, monitors, yeah. industrial level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it comes in like bulks that you put into the printer. It comes like a string. String, yeah, string, I saw that, and yeah. you're going to have a rough time unraveling it whenever it gets bent. Yeah, yeah. You can't saw a jumper with it. So let's go for this one. Okay. This is a bit of a symbolistic design. Mm. For this design, the idea... It's almost was like a shamrock. Exactly. But it's also from Norse mythology, combined a little bit with Egyptian. And there's also a symbol for infinite love, which I didn't even know until I started researching the idea. And the symbol for infinite love is actually branching off into this part. Mm -hmm. And from that symbol, I went for an ankh design, from an ankh to a bit of a spider web, because love 
can constrain a person, it can form a new web around that person, and everything will center around the new interest. And from that design, it became this. So this little bit is actually this big handmade. Wow. Area. So that's the little part within a heart shape and a Morse code that says I love you. Four, three, four. It should be four, break, three, four. Sure. It's four, three, four. Hmm. That's awesome. So that's where it all begins. That's that sketch. where it all begins. From a sketch toward a final print. Hmm. In between this and that, there's a lot of uh, working in one to 3D design, SketchUp, yeah. whatever suits the person who has to make it. Pretty cool. What else you got in that sketch file? <laughs> what I got in the sketch book. Is it okay to show it? Sure. Or is it top Not secret? All of them are prints. So some are all of them that's are just, fine, you know? Um, Let's see. Let, that that's still cool. I'm, I'm also interested in that. Now, tell me about that. Now, what's. It was actually a pitch for a client. I can't disclose the client's name. Sure, sure. You, we, we don't even need to know, really. The idea is that they were launching a new um, flower shop uh, chain. Yeah. They were branching out into a new country. And they wanted to make a design that says um, both the idea of a flower shop, both the idea of, uh, you know, it's uh, almost Valentine's Day and you most likely forgot. So the hand is getting pricked by the fact that the rose is uh, just freshly cut for the idea that you just forgot it's Valentine's. And behind it, although it looks like a perfect circle, if you look very carefully, it's actually a condom. You what? <laughs> Even the client was flabbergasted about that. He said that's the most brilliant idea of saying Valentine's because you forget about it. You have to buy a rose from some random place it's never perfectly cut. And after that, you also have to stop by and get some condoms, just in case you can pull it off and say you remembered and everything is okay. And that actually became a campaign. It got a little bit more polished, but this was the rough sketch and the pitch that sold the idea. That's awesome. Also, I appreciate the humor behind it because uh, humor is great. <laughs> you always have to have a sense of humor oh. while working with people. My God. I appreciate that. Designs. And when you mentioned condom, I couldn't unsee it. <laughs> this was actually because uh, the DC craze started. So a uh, client came and said he wanted a guitar pick. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a, it looks like a guitar it's pick. It's Arrow, but he's also a Flash fan. So we went for a redesigned idea of a guitar pick, out of which we cut out the idea of the Flash logo. Mm -hmm. And after this, it was just basically getting it into the form and the size that he wanted in 3D design and printing it. The yes. print itself, 10 minutes, the design, half an hour, just talking over a cup of coffee. Excellent. This ugly little thing is going to be part of the book um, that I'm writing now. You gotta Can't tell me about that <laughs> in a minute, in a minute. I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Currently it has no name, but it's there. You're writing a book, I want to know about that now, soon. Uh, if you remember in 2015, uh, 2016 respectively, there were a lot of famous people that died. Yeah, that was a good, bad year, Bowie being one of them. Yeah. I started making this little death calendar, which started in uh, late February, and I left it there because the year was getting more and more rough. A lot of artists were uh, just disappearing from this world. Yeah. Bob Elliott, Maurice White, Pat Harrington Jr., David Bowie. You got him right here. You're always with me. What the idea remained. This was actually the logo idea. I actually went through a lot of designs until I finally decided to make a logo. So the idea behind Your the logo, logo. Yeah, my logo. Okay. The idea behind it was quite simply put. I wanted a pen. I wanted my uh, eraser and my sharpener because I always start everything from a pen perspective. Yes. And from the pencil, I work up 
towards the idea of a pen. I'm going to ink it, make it permanent. From that, if um, I have a client who likes the way I do things, I'm going to make something out of acrylic for it. Mm. As in, if this would be the design that we settled for, I'm going to ink it. After I ink it, I'm going to get a big board and just paint it. And from the paint, I'm going to make a visual work, art piece, whatever you want. I can make the logo directly in Photoshop or in Illustrator or just go directly with the painting side by side and put it as a mural. Yeah. But there are very few who actually go for the idea. The few that do, never regret it. Hmm. But after all these ideas... I could ask you why, but uh, <laughs> it's pretty much self-explanatory. This was the final form. Let me see. Let's go for the back. Very nice, very nice. And this one was made for uh, the University of Design, where I was a guest speaker for a free painting session. Gala UAD. Yes, they have an annual event where they present all their works, basically like an observation event for them. And nice. some of them go further along to make uh, fashion designs all around Europe. Yeah. The top contenders. This was made for that event with my logo and their logo on Bob. That's pretty cool. I like that. That's really cool. Do you mind if I touch sure, it? Sure, go for it. Wow. I like it, yeah. You know what I like about it? It's like it looks handmade. Yeah, that's the idea. That's always the so idea that, that is, I try to go for. Let's not forget, that's, that is it the idea. It might be industrial, but we try to make it as much as possible resemble the fact that somebody spent the time, yeah. the energy, to draw it, to think of it, to redraw it a bunch of times, and after that, to bring it up to a 3D forum. And it's also hand-painted? It. It's also hand-painted. Yeah. And it's also... Um, There's a lot of man, you know, yeah. power behind it. It's not just machine. It's not supposed to be industry. Yeah. That's the idea. It's supposed to be a reconnection to, towards the artist. Wow. So you go for something which is modern, but you bring it back a bit. For example, this one. I don't have the 3D printed version with me. Okay. But this became the logo for a local harvesting competition. So there's a Hearthstone group here in Cluj. What is it? What's that? It's a game made by Blizzard. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a bit of the Blizzard logo for Hearthstone here. Okay. And underneath it, we have a little bit of the armaments that you would typically see in World of Warcraft. Ah. And that became their logo. It started from this sketch. We made the final version in black and white for the website and for the Facebook page. But while they were starting out, I was also sponsoring them and making all their prizes with their logo for them in 3D print. So let's go a little bit on Facebook mm. and find Arston Cluj. While it's there, fireside gathering. Here we go. This is the group page that they made. Here's the logo, the final version in black and white. And all the cover arts are still done pro bono. You did all that? Yeah. To share for their community. This is from one of their events. Yeah. There are a swell bunch of people. And when they started, they could not afford any design work. I did it for free. I still do it for free. Because after they started to actually earn something from the events, they decided to make a non-profit that handles old school games for mm. underprivileged children. So they okay. reorganized everything in the idea of bringing gaming and socializing to people in need. Wow. They go for retro gaming a lot. And I said, fine. I'll gladly work for free on uh, such conditions. Nice. It gives back to the community. And when something gives back, it's worth the time. That's nice. Yeah. The event was in a motor rock bistro, so it yeah. goes for the idea of being a rocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot.
It's it's still getting uh, some reflection, but I'm. Oh, that, that's we got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes some uh, fiddling around with the position. That's, that looks pretty good. Simple work, nice. simple designs. But as always, everything started from a pen and paper. That's important to remember. Pen and paper, and then possibly paint too. Yeah. Paintbrush. Um, this is unfinished. This is unfinished. This is unfinished. There's a lot of unfinished work here. Ah. Here it was the second version we decided not to do. Uh -huh. But it still remained an idea that we want to 3D print for the five year celebration. Yeah. And we're going to make it into a little lamp with a light inside. That, so yeah. we're going to print a rock shape with a semi moon on top of it that balance the rock. Yeah. And within the rock, we're going to put an LED. I can see that being very nice, yeah. And here's something that I do for fun. What do you see in this position? What do I see? It's kind of like, um, this is kind of like those psychology tests, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay, so honest. Uh, well, first, an eye. The first thing that strikes me. And the second thing, there's something Native American about it. Like a Native, Native American, American art. Eye. Okay. If I change the position to this. Uh, I see a... Uh, a syringe. A, a syringe. syringe. How about now? Guys, play it with me, right? Whoever's watching this video. How about now? Uh, I see some sort of a spacecraft. Spacecraft? Yeah. How about now? Oh, man, I see it. Um, a bird flying upwards. A bird flying upwards. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, with the bird, you never saw the worm. Wait, let me see. The worm. The worm. It has something in its beak. Yeah. Okay. Dude. So this is something that I like to do for fun. It's not a design that I would um, make I for somebody. It. It's just something that I would do for myself. Holy crap. And when printing something like this, I always want to start doing it. I never get the chance to do it because for each and every line, there would be another level to the print to create the illusion that I do on paper with it. So the entire print, whenever I want to do it, I remind myself it's going to take at least 48 hours. How do you do don't have a free moment to do it. You have to have a right mind for it too, because you need exactly. to see these things. <laughs> I also have a painting like this. Um, I think I still have the photos somewhere. It's a mask of a person laughing. Yeah. A jokerish face. Done in the same abstract idea. And ever since I painted it, nobody has seen the person who's uh, laughing in the painting. They only see either a cat, a sleeping pair of cats, <laughs> or uh, an insane moment that somebody broke a window. There's uh, got to be... There, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but Did they actually intended for somebody to be laughing. In that. <laughs> that was it for me. There was nothing else besides it. There's got to be some sort of a psychological thing about it too, you know. It tells a lot, says a lot about a person and what they see, and their personality, maybe. This is because I really enjoy Diablo. Yeah, no, but it's cool. I like the wings there. The wings itself was, uh, this was entirely made in one session for mm. a client. The print took about four hours just for the wings. So each wing had to be individually printed. It was a bit thicker than this. Hmm. So, after printing each and every one, you'll need to get a hot pen and glue it to the model hmm. with the hot pen. Wow. But you know, it was fun to make and fun to design. Yeah. This is just doodling because never hires to doodle. This was a bit of a self-portrait. Yeah. <laughs> I was feeling so smug that day, I said, why the hell not? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can. And this is the Japanese Prime Minister, which I just had to take a crack at. <laughs> he has such a funny face, I said, okay, I have to do it. Right. Okay, here again, tell me what you see. 
Well, I see a what the to the picture at the top. The picture. At the top. Well, I see a a knife and a cup. A knife and a, and a, and a carpet. And a carpet. Right. And if you go like this, does I it look like it's changed a bit? Yes, it does. Uh, I see. Uh, it, the for some reason the knife has turned into some sort of a feather pen. A feather pen. Yeah. But until now you have not noticed the little fish there. I haven't noticed it. And the fact that the feathered pen looks a bit like a boat with a row that has fallen off. Oh, well now that you mention it, it uh, totally looks like that. <laughs> that was the idea of just having fun. Oh my god, yeah, the perspective, because I'm looking at it up and down, but yeah. Poison ivy. Mm. You always need to know your roots. For me, design became a fascination more and more as I discovered DC, Marvel. Yeah. Comic books in general. Poison Ivy was always one of the best drawn female protagonists or antagonists, depending on the comic book that you were reading. Had to make it. And because I'm such a fan, I had to make him. It's pretty cool. Love the insanity in Joker. Yeah, who doesn't? This is not finished. This is a rough sketch. This is a punchline for a gamer cat. This would be me when I'm about 80. I can only hope. Somebody actually challenged me to see how do I see myself in 40 years, maybe 60. Uh -huh. I see myself as a grumpy old wise ass. And are you gonna are you gonna wear that that uh, well, that my cloak? Name is Caesar, so. <laughs> Yeah, you should do that now, actually. Wear the, the, the leaves. What character do you think this one is? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm if not you take a... Link, you take Mario, and you take Goku from Dragon Ball Z, you'll get this abomination. <laughs> it was just I love Child. I love Child of those, those characters. It was for a local pub that wanted to go for uh, gaming and have it a bit more child friendly. Oh. They wanted something that re resembles everything, but is not legally bound to copyright yeah. anywhere. I see, I see. <laughs> so we went for this one. Just play. Rocky Red. Still for the gamer pub idea. Frankly, no idea. <laughs> I even forgot it was in It's hard to keep up. Still for the gamer pub idea. Yeah, hey, I like it. It was a lot of back and forth. The mouse was nice. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, check that out. That was I actually love that one. a self-portrait. That's a self-portrait? That's a self-portrait. That's pretty cool, man. That's fit to be hung somewhere. I'm planning on making this one into an exposition which is going to combine a bit of 3D printing and recycling. The yeah. idea of making the robot me version. But the idea behind the robot is the fact that I had to build myself up. Mm -hmm. And basically when you come from Romania as a designer, you're not really perceived that well because you're a Romanian. Why so not? I Why not? I found myself in that circumstance. I have no idea. But you mean but internationally? Internationally speaking, you while I was working in Germany, I was constantly reminded that I'm being paid very well for a Romanian designer. Hmm. The only problem is I was living in Germany. Hmm. And that's a bit more expensive than living in Of course, in yeah. So I always felt that and the fact that I used to have my own name on my Facebook page. But after having a bit of an argument with a few clients, I said, okay, I'm going to change it directly into Japanese. I'm just going to translate my name, Caesar, into the Japanese version, which is Mikuzi Kashi. Yeah. And from Severs to Moroga, make Seto, which is the most Japanese sounding name that you can find. As in, if you watch Yu-Gi-Oh, there's a Seto Kaiba there. Perfect. Redid my name, changed it, put the same portfolio, nothing changed, nothing in the letter extra. From 300 ron, it jumped to 300 euros. Wow. So from not even 50 ron to the sixth time that amount because they had the impression that we're not working with a Romanian designer. Can you believe that? I can. 
Tell me more about that, man. Tell, let it out. What is the, you know? Let out your frustrations, well, your it's thoughts not on that. that much of a frustration. We need to get rid it's of this shit. It's more like I never understood why, because when you go and look into another place, take Japan for example. Mm. Most manga artists, big shock for the 21st century, are women. Mm. Most successful manga artists are women, but their pen name is a masculine name. Because as a woman writing and drawing manga within Japan, they find it difficult to get their work published. It's an old mentality that remained from something, and the same old mentality remained everywhere. Yeah. As if you're a designer from that country, while well, that country is not that appreciated. Ironically, most Romanians work for uh, large corporations worldwide, and are responsible for a lot of things, but they don't get their due worth because they're Romanians. Yeah, supposedly, you know, well, I mean, it's almost, it's, I, 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 I see it all the time, you know, there's some, some countries that uh, just, you know, that get preference in certain industries. So that's also true exactly, in the arts. And I never understood why. Yeah, it's um, like, you know, rough, for example, this, the obvious example I can think of is like rock music in England in exactly. terms of uh, <laughs> Europe, you know. Exactly. There's lots of other con countries, but, you know, not... If the same rock band would be in America, for example, yeah. well, overnight you'd be a sensation and everybody would be bowing to get you new or a little or, or, you know, if it was from any other country but England or America, then a rock band that is better than the average rock band from England or America probably is not going to get into the charts. Exactly. Although rock music isn't making the charts nowadays, that's a different problem though, but anyways. <laughs> it's a weird situation, regardless yeah. of field, you'll see it. Um, one of my best friends is a self-published author. Mm -hmm. and is just finishing the fourth book of the series. Yeah. When he wanted to become a self-published artist, the main problem he found was the teachers that he had were saying, there's no chance that you're going to get this published. Mm, there's no not an audience for your type of book. Nobody wants bad fiction that actually advertises itself as yeah. bad fiction. And he did it. Just mm. to prove the point that he can do it. I love it when people do that, you know, just defy barriers, conventions, rule books, etc. You know, that's the stuff. That's, that's what keeps things moving forward, after all. Exactly. It's not easy though, right? It's not easy, but if it's something that you like, it's something worth doing. So, can you tell me a little bit, you mentioned about the book. The book. You mentioned the book, meanwhile I'm gonna well, vape a little bit too. The book is actually... This. Well, let's get the story straight. Right. As I said, I have a friend who became a self-published author. When he was doing this, the moment he started doing this, he actually became a little bit outraged that he's basically the first one to do it. Uh -huh. Cluj, yeah. And decided to say, okay, you've got a story, you're going to write a book, whether you like it or not. He started pestering me. I said, okay, I'm going to write it, calm down, I'll publish it later. And that's where the idea of the book started. Mm. Um, the book itself, it's basically, well, I say it's autobiographical because it does involve most of my life. But it's more the philosophy that I've accumulated in almost 20 years of work. Okay. So in 20 years of work, I had a lot of self-reflection moments, I had a lot of um, challenging moments, and I said, okay, might as well make it about that. Because that's something interesting to write about. Not many people can say they started working at 14, yeah. And not many people can say they had their first international project at 22. Mm -hmm. And the fall from that point is actually a good story itself. Because you get from the point where everybody is saluting you on the street in Germany because they know where you work, to the point where you come back in Romania and discover that everybody that knows you from abroad no longer wants to talk to you. That's true, you know. Because you've become that little thing that has... Uh, its own brand behind it, and because you're tied down by a non-disclosure, you can't work it. Mm. But all the other designers that I used to call friends, not so much nowadays, next to me. Huh. I could, a we little could. bit of envy, a little bit of uh, spite, and yeah. I don't know, maybe fear. I never understood exactly why. But Competition. Yeah. 
but not a healthy form. Via, are you familiar with Pierre Bourdieu? Yeah, yes. you are? Yeah, he makes a lot of sense. Well, it's sad when you have to live it. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the painful part, but from it... You How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? I discovered a few people that are worth my while. And with those people, I enjoy spending my time. I enjoy spending a cup of coffee, a small project, an idea, mm. a quick 10 minute uh, show or whatever they want to do. If they want to, well, for example, even the at Gala, when I went as a guest speaker, it was the same idea as in my friend uh, enjoyed my work. I really enjoy spending time watching him work and he said, you know, I have a lot of students that would be interested in this. I'm not exactly sure how many of them would actually pick it up. But if you have the time, I said, sure. The faculty is about 20 minutes away from my home. Mm -hmm. by foot. I said, I'll grab the printer, pop on by and do a little lecture. The lecture ended up being a couple of hours long. Yeah. And from it, well, a few of mine did spark interest, but not a few, uh, not even a few of them actually get to the practical application part. Uh. There was one project I was glad to help, but other than that, to each their own. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. I experience the same stuff. You know, my way of handling it is to just avoid it. Like, you know, just pretend, you know. I like facing it head on. Yeah. This is me, this is what I do. Like it or not, I'm here to stay. I guess it, avoiding it isn't the right word. I think it's more, I broaden my scope. It used to be that I was just about films. Broaden your horizon. Yeah, it used to be that I was just about films. I learned very early on that it wasn't even just about the big names at film festivals. In fact, the big names were disappointing. Always disappointing. And then at a film festival. I found out that I never only loved film. It was more about just the arts, and the and there's nothing broader than, than you know, that has a broader definition than the arts. Well, there is, but art has a broader definition than it's usually defined. So, anyways, that was fascinating, man. We've been uh, this was a fascinating encounter, and I'm glad to have documented it. Is there anything else that you would like to get off your chest or talk about or discuss? Um, for anybody that wants to get in the field of creative works, arts, um, content creation, whatever you want to call it, design, because that's the general scope of it. Mm. Uh, there's no right way of doing it. There's no formal right way of doing it. I've had the privilege of uh, working with people who had so many diplomas in art fields that their entire portfolio was assembled from the diplomas. And I also had the pleasure of working with people who just at the age of 40 decided to pick up a brush and do something totally amazing. And at the end of that all, you can see the passion compared to the technique. And the passion always wins. So if you have a passion for something, follow it, do it. Even as a side project, you never know where it uh, actually goes. Because in my case, from a little bit of side project, it got me towards a stage where very few get. And from that stage, it got me a sense of meaning that I could not find in any other work. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. in, I have my day job, but the day job does not define me. My work defines myself, and my work is always done after I finish the day job. You never know what event is going to change your life, exactly. impact, or the ways in which it will impact your exactly. life. Right? Like Terry Pratchett, he was an editor for uh, electric... Um, tabloid, if I remember correctly, um, and he ended up being the best-selling uh, author in UK for quite a while. He was the mentor and friend to Neil Gaiman, and let's face it, how is the world without Terry Pratchett or Neil Gaiman? Yeah, they left a mark. They will always leave a mark, because they follow their passions. And then there are other people who just do it constantly as a day job, and they just want their inclination and the fame that comes with the territory. But you see their work over time declining, going down towards something which is repetitive because the inspiration runs out. Well, I think the key word there is passion, right? Because passion yeah. isn't just, it's, there's a lot of pain involved in that word. 
There's a lot of sacrifice. A lot of inspiration in that vein. I always find a lot of creativity in your passion. Yeah. And if you really like something, you'll just wake up and constantly think about it. As in, I wake up, I go to my job, I'm always thinking what I'm going to do in that evening, how much time do I have to paint? Do I get the chance to finish the sketch that I've started about two months ago and I want to finish that so I can 3D print that? And when I start a sketch, it's always from 2D. And after that, for the printing, I have to do two more sketches for the perspective so I can get the proportions exactly as I want them. But it's not something that I feel tires me or wears me down. It's something that I want to do. And it's something that will always motivate me to do it. It could be that I'm sick as a dog and can't yeah. get out of bed, but I'll find my way to a sketchbook because I got about 50 lying around the house. None of them are full. Just in case I don't like the paper, uh, I want the paper from the other sketchbook, I'll always grab the one that I need and just go for it. Do you ever feel like you don't get any downtime or do you even want downtime? Time, like a break. It is my downtime. That's ah. the most beautiful part. It's like when what they I'm say, yeah. It's not work it if you enjoy be doing it. 16 hours straight. Yeah. That was the slowest process I had for one of my clients. I was actually working in an office here in Cluj. So with a couple of friends. Uh, they were working um, back in the development for the website. I was working front end. And the client was just amazing. He said, go for it, be creative. It's for an art gallery. Just have fun with it. Mm -hmm. Think about all the pictures that I sent. Do something original with them. So I started designing the entire background of the website as an abstract piece of work from the works he sent over. Yeah. It wasn't only digital. We started working basically as I always do with a pencil. And from the pencil, I started inking it. I started painting over it. And by the time I was done, 16 hours just flew by. For me, it was maybe 20 minutes. I didn't have a smoke break. I didn't have a coffee break. Wow. I didn't even do anything except sketch. And the two developers that I was working with, one fell asleep waiting for me. And the other one fell because he said, fuck this shit. I'm not going to spend another night because Caesar is being Caesar. And I realized that the time flew by the moment that the sun started hitting my face because the sun always had uh, hit my uh, workstation there at around 10 a.m. in the morning. And it was just, oh my God, I was supposed to be at the other job. <laughs> so I had to call in sick that day. Yeah. Because I just forgot about myself, but it was very fun. And I didn't feel any bit of work in me, as in I didn't feel tired or I didn't regret the hours. I felt more rested than going to sleep that night. Hmm. That was everything. And for those moments, you just go on and on and on. Is that going to be in the book? Yeah, that's actually one of the chapters of the book. Uh, there's no name for such a moment. So no matter how many times I discuss this with people, I can't find a name. But it's a moment that you can sense coming close to you. It's a moment of creation that you feel deep inside that wants to come out. You know it's going to be there in some certain point in time but you can't pinpoint the exact moment, so you just rush towards it. Mm. So I basically named it it, and you're always rushing towards it. It's there for a moment, you live within it. It's there with or without you. So right. when it comes down to creation, there's a Zen guys to it. I might create something here that some totally different artists in another part of uh, the world will create, and it'll be very similar. For example, there was one print that I made for uh, Christine. It has a bit of an Indian Aztec motif to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And about four years after I made it, even forgot that we had it in the house, I found this on a free website. Yeah. It's a free to download. It's almost similar to mine. It's just a bit differently proportioned yeah and the fact that really got me thinking was like i made this one and the one that i see here it's almost identical by its proportions it's not the same the color pattern is different the depth of it is totally not something that i would have done 
but the artist is in Mexico. Mm. So it was basically a Zen guys moment when two artists had a similar idea. We've never interacted. Yeah. We've never met. He's named also Caesar, which was the most brilliant coincidence I ever saw in my life. As in two artists, two 3D design workers named Caesar had the same idea at the same time. One posted it on the internet and one just made it as a present. That's just amazing. Yeah, it's almost like a discovery as well as creation. Exactly. It's like the pyramids. Yeah. Aztecs had the pyramids, Egyptians had the pyramids, but there was no communication between them as we know. But it was the same guys of the moment. They had to be made. Right. That's the moment that you're rushing towards. That's a very spiritual uh, understanding of it. It is. Do you, find, do you think you consider yourself a spiritual person? I finished theology in high school Yeah. on a vocational level. So as a spiritual person, I would say yes, uh, a Christian, but a bit more open-minded than my teachers would have had me. Right. So I went from that and just dealt forward. Mm -hmm. And I found this and I'm trying to define it in an entire book. Maybe I got something, maybe I don't. Sure. Who knows? Maybe when I finish it. So what, let's pick something to close this video with. What's going to, going to be the closing shot? Let's close it with the book. It this was, is the cover. This is not the cover. This is a notebook I got as a gift. It's from Blizzard because I am a Blizzard fan. Yeah. It was definitely not intended to be a sketchbook or the type of book in which another book would uh, find its yeah. roots. But as such, it became the basics of a book. And as per usual, I start with the pen and then ink. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is a <laughs> very annoying hobby. You're mine. writing it in English? I'm writing it in English because English was originally my mother tongue. Oh, really? I was born in Cluj, but my mother spoke English. Okay. She was working for a Romanian-American firm, and as such, the main language was English at that ah. time. When she came home, she forgot that she had a baby who had no idea what language <laughs> she was speaking and what language to pick up. Yeah. So I started learning Romanian as I was going to uh, the first grade, which was not the type of thing that you want in <laughs> the early 90s in Romanian, where we were post-communist. Yeah. And everybody was speaking Romanian and not so many people were speaking English. Mm -hmm. So I had a very difficult period of time talking to my teachers. We are who we are because of the challenges we encounter, right? Yeah. And we overcome or not. All right. Well, thank you very much. You were so kind to let me film you and film our conversation. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Let's zoom in on this as an ending.